560 The Answer online at 560theanswer.com on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. America First with Sebastian Gorka. Today at 3, right before Sean Thompson at 4 on AM560 The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and uh, former ABC7 political reporter Charles Thomas in for Amy J this morning. And uh, Charles, um, interesting piece over at the Free Press. That's Barry Weiss's outlet. The uh, debate in high schools is over. Actually, the debates, plural, are over. This uh, piece by uh, a former high school debate uh, champion who also debated... uh, uh, at the collegiate level, did fairly well. And he coached a debate team at an underprivileged high school a few years back, underprivileged high school in Miami. Um, and he, he describes uh, what he calls witnessing the pillars of high school debate start to crumble. Not surprising if it happens on a college campus, then it's going to go back to secondary and primary schools that's going to radiate out into the culture and that's what's happened Mm -hmm. we all live on a college campus now as andrew sullivan famously said a few years ago um and he is referencing the judges in these debate competitions and their paradigms there's a public database main by uh, maintained by the debating society that where judges post quote-unquote paradigms which explain what they look for during a debate because, of course, those participating in the debate won't know until just before the debate who will be judging them. For example, if a judge prefers competitors not to spread, speak a mile a minute, debaters might moderate their pace. If a judge emphasizes impacts, the reason why an argument matters, debaters adjust accordingly. But he goes on to say, let's say when the high school sophomore clicks the uh, on this uh, this uh, inventory of all the judges and their paradigms. She sees that her judge is Lila Lavender, the 2019 national debate champion, whose paradigm reads, quote, before anything else, including being a debate judge, I am a Marxist Leninist Maoist. (laughs) I cannot check the revolutionary proletarian science at the door when I'm judging. I will no longer evaluate and thus never vote for rightist capitalist imperialist positions and arguments. Examples of arguments of this nature are as follows. Fascism, good. Capitalism, good. Imperialist war, good. Neoliberalism, good. Defensive U.S. or otherwise bourgeois nationalism, Zionism, or normalizing Israel, colonialism, good. U.S. white fascist policing, good, etc. So uh, the author makes the point, how does a high school sophomore feel (laughs) when she walks into a room who maybe is not a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, and she walks into a room to make an argument about some public policy matter, and she's facing Lila Lavender. And and this person remains a debate judge. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, it's it's a lot like what what's going on in in journalism, believe it or not. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, it's it's like you. There are certain criteria now that you have to. Now have now to contrast that. Like uh, contrast that with another uh, paradigm he shares, a former West Point debater named Henry Smith. His paradigm uh, asks students to, quote, focus on clarity over speed and reminds them that every argument should explain exactly how and how they win the debate. OK, that's neutral. Um, uh, but then we go back to another one like Shubham Gupta. Quote, if you are discussing immigrants in a round and describe the person as illegal, I will immediately stop the round, give you the loss with low speaks, low speaker points, give you a stern lecture, and then talk to your coach. I will not have you making the debate space unsafe. And illegal is a is one of the naughty words. You can't say illegal when discussing anyone who might enter the country. Right. means other than those described by law. Yes, right. Maybe that's the way you'd have to say it. People who enter the country by means other than those prescribed by law. Mm, that's the way. I don't know. You'd probably still get that stern lecture. Uh, for more on what's happening in K through 12 education, education generally, we're pleased to be joined by our friend Ian Rowe, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, visiting fellow at the Woodson Center, author of Agency: The Four Point Plan for All Children to Overcome the Victimhood Narrative 
and discover their pathway to power. I think the title of that book would uh, trigger some of these judges. And I think Ian Rowe would get a stern lecture, too, as well. Ian, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. I very much, but I'd respond. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't uh, uh, concede my voice. <laughs> well, I mean, but, you know, it's just an interesting piece about a relatively, um, uh, you know, small part of the high school and collegiate experience. But it does speak to the larger culture around expressing yourself. And I mean, just how the uh, the illiberal have insinuated themselves in every space in the country, particularly in uh, places of of ostensibly learning. No, no, absolutely. I, you know, my, my colleague, uh, Sam Abrams at AEI, did a study last year where he found something like 60 to 70 percent of high school students self-censor, that they're fearful of expressing an opinion that they think would differ from what they, they believe their teacher thinks or what their peers think, so better just not to share their opinion at all. And that that kind of and so you wonder why when kids get to college or higher education they're so intolerant of other views or they just allow things to happen without um uh you know without uh, com- you know putting forth competing ideas it's very dangerous for our country and you know part of the reason you know i'm on this morning is that you know there's now another example of it with the uh the new york times i mean you know you're talking about debate the new york times uh some of your viewers might know had a, a magazine issue a couple of years ago called uh the 1619 project oh, yeah. where they argue that the united states is you know the founding principles are false when they were written the country wasn't even founded in 1776 but it was founded in 1619 they've just created a new curriculum unit for high school uh, focused on reparations math. It's not about math. It's about convincing math. young people. Yeah. yeah, it's about convincing young people that black people in this country, or black young people, are not free. They're still enslaved and are owed by um, the federal government trillions of dollars of money. And in this curriculum, there's no there, there's no competing point of view you know you're just supposed to take these lessons and then just believe that black people are inherent victims it's outrageous and and the math uh, the reparations math uh, what, what's the math piece of this the uh, just sort of talking <laughs> tar- talking generally about uh, numbers like we see in these uh, commissions that have been stood up by gavin newsom yeah, or or exactly or brandon exactly. johnson i mean Let's not mention the fact that based on the most recent national assessment for educational progress, something like only eight or nine percent of black students are doing math at proficiency levels. I mean, just think about that for a second. More than 90 percent of black students in this country are not doing math at, at uh, proficiency levels. And what the New York Times 1619 Project is putting forth is a math curriculum that is much less about math than it is about the ideology that they're trying to implement. So the kinds of assignments are, well, if a white person X number of years ago had this number of slaves and, um, you know, know, a slave was worth this much, and, you know, what's the formula that you would use to calculate how much you're owed as a black person today? I mean, extremely rudimentary very basic math, which is not even at the high school level, because you realize it's actually not about teaching math. It's about teaching the ideology. And that's what's so dangerous. I mean, you know, not, you know, look, if someone wanted to focus on the topic of reparations as a, as a, as a subject matter, it's certainly worthy of exploration. It, it's a phenomena that occur, has occurred. But what this is, is actually trying to use math as as the vehicle through which you're pulling into this idea that you're forever uh, victimized, both historic and present day. And it just has to be called out for what it is, indoctrination into an ideology that's destructive and divisive. 
And when we're talking about this being part of the 1619 Project curriculum that is pushed into public schools, we're talking about a curriculum that's in thousands of schools after a few years now, right? Unfortunately, when the, you know, the New York Times decided they wanted to go just beyond a magazine issue, you know, where they're engaging mostly adult readers, they said, you know what, we want the hearts and minds of young people. So they crafted a curriculum. Um, and, uh, you know, in response, uh, Bob Woodson, a you know, great leader at the Woodson Center, said, you know what, we're going to create a curriculum in response to this that tells a more expansive story of the African-American experience in the United States. And we built this amazing curriculum, warts and all, uh, that tells not only, for example, the, the story of the Tulsa Massacre, but it tells the story of the creation of black wealth. Um, and, and the creation of Black Wall Street, you know, during Jim Crow. How was it that during this period of time, you know, black people could amass such wealth? Then we tell the story of the Tulsa Massacre, and then we tell the story of the rebuild. So basically, tell the whole story, warts and all. This curriculum has now been downloaded more than 85,000 times by teachers in all 50 states, in every kind of school, private school, public school, religious school, charter school, home school. And so it was important to provide this uh, counterbalance to what we thought was this very negative cherry-picking curriculum that the New York Times is now imposing into schools. And, and by the way, and not just any schools, in some of the lowest performing schools in the country, Chicago, Newark. I mean, these are schools where the, the literacy rates are typically in the single digit. And so to have a curriculum which is now foisting this ideology that, you know, it's the country that's, that's racist and harmful and that's why you're not doing well, as opposed to the kinds of strategies that we know are so important for uplifting all kids. So yes, the New York Times put together this curriculum, the reparations math is now their next um, evolution. And again, it's just harmful for children. You know, I would agree that, you know, this is a matter of what is the narrative uh, that you, uh, under which you teach history. The facts remain the same, but the narrative, black people are overcomers. We are not victims. Right. We are victors. And our history yep. is, is proof positive of that that we have that met every challenge and overcome. And I think that's what we need to teach as opposed to the narrative that we are victims and will remain victims forever. You know, you, what you just said is so profound. I mean, listen to this. So the, the New York Times partnered with the Pulitzer Center and they've, they've print, published the curriculum. And something that um, uh, curriculum providers do uh, typically to demonstrate the strength of their curriculum is they have examples of student work, right? Because once you show examples of student work who've, who've completed that curriculum, then you really get to see the quality of learning. So look, listen to this example. This is literally the first example that the Pulitzer uh, Center publishes as proof of the effectiveness of their reparations math curriculum. This is what a black student wrote in high school who completed the curriculum. Quote, what I learned after this curriculum is that we as black people are still not free. End quote. Mm. This, is, this is what the Pulitzer Center, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. This is the proof of the effectiveness of the curriculum. Uh, you know, uh, in Illinois, you may have heard, you may not, because it's fresh. Um, we just became the first state in the nation to uh, rescind a tax credit scholarship program, an opportunity scholarship program that had been implemented. So Illinois continues to lead the nation in being the bad example. Um, but given what you're saying, I mean, first of all, for those who don't know, uh, Ian ran uh, charter schools in the Bronx. Um, so what you know about education and what you know yep. about the school choice movement and what yep. you're describing in terms of the, the Woodson curriculum being downloaded by teachers, but then you've got the Pulitzer Foundation, the New York Times, 
uh, and the 1619 Project, funded by Corporate America, all driving this curriculum through most of the government schools. How important is the school choice movement, which, by the way, is still very healthy in more than two dozen states, but but how important is that school choice movement to sustain it so that parents do have a choice to not send their kids to schools where nobody learns to read or do math, literally in some cases? Um, right. You know, just comment on, on the, the yeah. how important school choice is as part of this effort to um, push back against uh, against reparations math. Well, you know, I always love the people who are from middle and upper class communities who are, you know, who you can't have school choice. That's going to wreck the, the public school system. And of course, they exercise school choice every single day for their children. You know, they're they're moving to the suburbs. They're they're sending their kids to private schools. So the thought of them not having school choice for their own children. Oh, it's so deeply hypocritical. And so the, 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 the most vulnerable students in our country, the ones who are in most desperate need of high quality education, those are the young people who are generally being um, uh, deprived of school choice. In the district in which we just launched, uh, we just launched a virtues based international baccalaureate high school in the Bronx in District 12. I'm sorry, District 7. Only 12. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, only 7% of the kids that start ninth grade four years later graduate from high school ready for college, meaning that 93% start ninth grade and either drop out or they actually do earn their high school diploma but still can't do math nor reading without remediation. And this is a district in, you know, throughout New York City where there's a cap on charter schools meaning that if someone had a great idea, you couldn't do it. And so imagine you're a parent, you're a 22-year-old parent. Whatever decisions you may have made in your own life, you want the best for your kid. But the only choice that you have is to send them to a school where nine, historically only 90, you know, 93% of kids aren't graduating from high school ready for college. That's the reality. You know, and so for folks who are, you know, exercising choice in their own lives, but depriving it of kids who are in desperate need. It's the ultimate hypocrisy. So we have to fight for educational freedom, school choice. It's fundamental. There are other elements that matter as well. Strong families, you know, access to strong faith commitments. So there are other elements that are important. But if we're depriving kids of the very first rung, which is access to a high quality education, why is it that we think we'll get better outcomes down the road for these kids who aren't being given a real shot? He is Ian Rowe, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Visiting Fellow at the Woodson Center, author of the book Agency, The Four-Point Plan for All Children to Overcome the Victimhood Narrative and Discover Their Pathway to Power. You should pick that book up and you should download the uh, uh, 1776 curriculum from the Woodson Center that Ian Rowe was talking about as well. And and it's Uh, free of charge by the way that curriculum is free of charge very so good the, the, yeah it's, it's, we're, it's we're, amazing you know we're, we're talking about uh, we're talking about uh, whether or not kids should go to college anymore pretty soon we're going to be talking about whether kids should go to high school or grade school anymore just you know Khan Academy the Woodson curriculum you can piece together an education <laughs> that's better right uh, well it, there's been there's been an explosion in homeschooling since yeah. COVID more and more yeah. parents particularly in the black community Particularly, you know, went from 3.3 percent to 16.1 percent of black parents interested in wow. homeschooling for their kids. You know, wow. it's it's happening. It's happening. It's not happening enough, but it is Ian, happening. Ian Rowe, thanks so much for joining us. As always, appreciate it. Thank you. And he joined us on the Turnkey Dot Pro Answer Line. The stories you need to know to start your day. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. Hi, it's Amy, and MyPillow is excited to bring you their biggest bedding sale ever. Our friend Mike Lindell created the Giza Dream bed sheets. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me, which is 